Economic competition is what forces innumerable disparate individual decisions to be reconciled with one another. As transactions terms are forced to change in response to changes in supply and demand, which in turn change economic activities. This is not a matter of faith, as Dworkin would have it, or of ideology, as Dewey would have it, but of economic literacy. John Dewey could depict businesses as controlling markets, but that position is not inherent in being ideologically on the left. Karl Marx was certainly on the left, but the difference was that he had studied economics as deeply as any one of his time. Just as Karl Marx did not attribute what he saw as the detrimental effects of a market economy to individual capitalists, so Adam Smith did not attribute what he saw as the beneficial effects of a market economy to individual capitalists. Smith's depictions of businessmen were at least as negative as those of Marx, even though Smith is rightly regarded as the patron saint of free market economics. According to Smith, the beneficial social effects of the businessman's endeavors are no part of his intention. Both in Adam Smith's day and today, more than two centuries later, arguments for a free market economy are based on the systemic effects of such economies in allocating scarce resources which have alternative uses through competition in the marketplace. Whether one agrees or disagrees with the conclusions, this is the argument that must be confronted or evaded. Contrary to Dewey and many others, systemic arguments are independent of any notions of atomistic individualism. These are not arguments that each individual's well-being adds up to the well-being of society. Such an argument would ignore the systemic interactions which are at the heart of economic analysis, whether by Adam Smith, Karl Marx, or other economists. These economic arguments need not be elaborated here, since they are spelled out at length in economics textbooks. What is relevant here is that those intellectuals who see chaos as the alternative to government planning or control have seldom bothered to confront those arguments and have instead misconceived the issue and distorted the arguments of those with different views. Despite the often expressed dichotomy between chaos and planning, what is called planning is the forcible suppression of millions of people's plans by a government-imposed plan. What is considered to be chaos are systemic interactions whose nature, logic, and consequences are seldom examined by those who simply assume that planning by surrogate decision-makers must be better. Herbert Crowley, the first editor of the New Republic and a major figure in the Progressive Era, characterized Thomas Jefferson's conception of limited government as the old fatal policy of drift, as contrasted with Alexander Hamilton's policy of energetic and intelligent assertion of the national good. According to Crowley, what was needed was an energetic and clear-sighted central government. In this conception, progress depends on surrogate decision-makers, rather than on millions of others making their own decisions and exerting their own efforts. Despite the notion that scarcity is contrived for the sake of profit in a market economy, that scarcity is at the heart of any economy, capitalist, socialist, feudal, or whatever. Given that this scarcity is inherent in the system as a whole, any system, that scarcity must be conveyed to each individual in some way. In other words, it makes no sense for any economy to produce as much as physically possible of any given product, because that would have to be done with scarce resources which could be used to produce other products, whose supply is also inherently limited to less than what people want. Markets in capitalist economies reconcile these competing demands for the same resources through price movements in both the markets for consumer goods and the market for the resources which go into producing those consumer goods. These prices make it unprofitable for one producer to use a resource beyond the point where that resource has a greater value to some competing producer who is bidding for that same resource. For the individual manufacturer, the point at which it would no longer be profitable to use more of some factor of production, land, labor, machinery, etc., is indeed the point which provides the limit of that manufacturer's output, even when it would be physically possible to produce more. But while profitability and unprofitability convey that limit, they are not what cause that limit, which is due to the scarcity of resources inherent in any economic system, whether or not it is a profit-based system. Producing more of a given output in disregard of those limits does not make an economy more prosperous. On the contrary, it means producing an excess of one output at the cost of a shortage of another output that could have been produced with the same resources. This was a painfully common situation in the government-run economy of the Soviet Union, where unsold goods often piled up in warehouses, while dire shortages had people waiting in long lines for other goods. Ironically, Marx and Engels had foreseen the economic consequences of fiat prices created by government, rather than by supply and demand, long before the founding of the Soviet Union, 
Even though the Soviets claimed to be following Marxian principles, when publishing a later edition of Marx's 1847 book, The Poverty of Philosophy, in which Marx rejected fiat pricing, Engels spelled out the problems in his editor's introduction. He pointed out that price fluctuations have forcibly brought home to the individual commodity producers what things and what quantity of them society requires or does not require. Without such a mechanism, he demanded to know what guarantee we have that necessary quantity, and not more, of each product will be produced, that we shall not go hungry in regard to corn and meat while we are choked in beet sugar and drowned in potato spirit, that we shall not lack trousers to cover our nakedness while trouser buttons flood us in millions. On this point, the difference between Marx and Engels on the one hand, and most other intellectuals of the left on the other, was simply that Marx and Engels had studied economics, and the others usually had not. A volitional view of economics enables the intelligentsia, like politicians and others, to dramatize economics, explaining high prices by greed and low wages by a lack of compassion, for example. While this is part of an ideological vision, an ideology of the left is not sufficient by itself to explain this approach. I paint the capitalist and the landlord in no sense couleur de rose, Karl Marx said in the introduction of the first volume of Capital. My standpoint, he added, however, can less than any other make the individual responsible for relations whose creature he socially remains, however much he may subjectively raise himself above them. In short, prices and wages were not determined volitionally, but systemically. Understanding that was not a question of being on the left or not, but of being economically literate or illiterate. The underlying notion of volitional pricing has, in our own times, led to at least a dozen federal investigations of American oil companies over the years in response to either gasoline shortages or increases in gasoline prices, with none of these investigations turning up facts to support the sinister explanations abounding in the media and in politics when these investigations were launched. Many people find it hard to believe that negative economic events are not a result of villainy, even though they accept positive economic events the declining prices of computers that are far better than earlier computers, for example, as being just a result of progress that happens somehow. In a market economy, prices convey an underlying reality about supply and demand, and about production costs behind supply, as well as innumerable individual preferences and trade-offs behind demand. By regarding prices as merely arbitrary social constructs, some can imagine that existing prices can be replaced by prices controlled by government, reflecting wiser and nobler notions, such as affordable housing or reasonable health care costs. A history of price controls going back for centuries in countries around the world shows negative and even disastrous consequences from treating prices as mere arbitrary constructs rather than as symptoms and conveyances of an underlying reality that is not nearly as susceptible to control as the prices are. As far as many, if not most, intellectuals are concerned, history would show that, but does not, because they often see no need to consult history or any other validation process beyond the peer consensus of other similarly disposed intellectuals when discussing economic issues. The crucial distinction between market transactions and collective decision-making is that in the market people are rewarded according to the value of their goods and services to those particular individuals who receive those goods and services, and who have every incentive to seek alternative sources so as to minimize their costs just as sellers of goods and services have every incentive to seek the highest bids for what they have to offer. But collective decision-making by third parties allows those third parties to superimpose their preferences on others at no cost to themselves, and to become the arbiters of other people's economic fate without accountability for the consequences.